session is uh, by Dr. Rita, and uh, uh, the title of today's presentation is the Learning Analytics in Higher Education, a brief review. Uh, today's learning objective is the learning analytical definition and its categories, learning analytical benefits and challenges, level of learning analytics, learning analytics techniques, and the trend of the learning analytics and education. I am highly obliged to introduce uh, Dr. Rita, uh, who is a MD, MPH, PhD in e-learning, especially. And she is currently an associate professor and head of e-learning and medical education department at School of Medicine, Tehran University of uh, Medical Sciences, Iran. Uh, we are lucky that uh, we met uh, Dr. Rita with and Dr. Shole uh, in during the International Conference of Medical Education. Dr. Rita has performed several development center uh, research projects in the field of e-learning and medical education in Iran. Some of the some of which are briefly, I will uh, let you all know, and it is our proud that as a teacher you are here. One of the important projects that you completed is the academic ranking of the medical schools Certification of the educational services and the ex next uh, matrix uh, system for uh, faculties, members, and activities. Comprehensive educational award system, design and establishment of e continuous medical school education. That is, uh, summary is E and CME. It is very important uh, on this e learning uh, platform that Dr. Rita has completed this project. Another project was that is the national in, uh, institutional accreditation system of the e-learning centers. The development of the established of Iran national massive open online courses that is called MOOCs and CEO have is, has also established many webinars on the MOOCs, those platforms. And the national learning uh, management system, LMS, Professor, uh, Rita is a very humble, she is a very good teacher, she is a good administrator, we have seen uh, actually with our eyes, and the, she has published several books and several uh, articles. I need more than three hours to describe all of them. Dr. Rita, over to you for today's section. Welcome at the platform of CBO. Thank you, Professor Bohari. Actually, uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation of me. I'm so honored to be a part of this event, having you all here, and I should thank the participants too that you have dedicated your time for uh, this session. And uh, my special thanks to Professor Zaidi for uh, you know building such a community and such series of academic events, and also. Uh, I would like to sincerely thank Dr. Iftikhar that during these days I had a, a lot of trouble for him for managing this event and he helped me so much, he supported me kindly. Uh, and finally, I would like to have your permission, uh, to get your permission, Professor Bukhari, if you let me, I will start the presentation. Okay. Yes, better. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. In this short, uh, you know, webinar, we are going to have a brief review of learning analytics and its application in higher education. Uh, if I want to have a review on the agenda of this presentation, I will focus on answering some WH questions of English language uh, with regard to learning analytics. And obviously, when we talk about WH questions with a scientific concept, we will start with what? So the first question is, what is learning analytics? I would prefer to read this definition from the slide and not paraphrasing it so that we can understand the main components of the definition. Learning analytics is the collection, measurement, interpretation, and reporting of data about learners, learning experiences, and learning programs 
In order to understand and improve students' learning and educational organization performance, you can see four main messages in this definition. The first one is that learning analytics is about collection, measurement, interpretation, and reporting. And the other component that is marked in red is data. And there are three categories of learners, learning experiences, and learning programs that uh, you know the data are gathered about. Uh, and the final statement, final part of the sentence is the aim of learning analytics that we want to understand and then improve when students' learning and educational organizations performance. So pay attention that during this presentation, we are going to have, you know, review more details on each of these four components of this definition. But let's just start with the one that is marked in red, and this is the word data. When you are talking about learning analytics generally, you uh, you think of big data. It is not a matter of what we do, for example, in research, our researchers. I mean that, for example, we have a limited set of data about, for example, 100, 200, or 1,000 students, and then we conduct some statistical you know, analysis on them, and we report the result as a, a for example, a article in a journal. No, this is not the case. When you talk about learning analytics these days, you think of big data. And big data has three main characteristics that are started with three V, the, the words that are start with the uh, alphabet V in English. The first one is volume. When you talk about big data, it means maybe terabytes of data, uh, terabytes of records, transcripts, files, graphs, image, tables, and so on. So you have a big volume of data. The second V stands for velocity, that it can be a batch or near time or real time, a streaming, a streaming type of the velocity. So you need somehow uh, to you know, capture a minimum level of velocity then, uh, for the transaction of data. And the last V stands for variety. That means that when you work on learning analytics data, it, they may be a structure, semi-structure, or unstructured ones. So the data that we are working with when it comes to learning analytics is a big data, and the characteristics are summarized in these three Vs. And this is this big data, big data generally is used for projects in the field of machine learning, predictive modeling, or other advanced analytics that we are going to have some examples, some uh, questions, uh, some example questions on learning analytics and the benefits that we can have through conducting these analytics. But before going on, because there are two terms in the literature, in the references and articles, textbooks, I mean, and uh, literary articles that they are sometimes interchangeably used. And these two terms are learning analytics and educational data mining. These two terms are frequently used in the literature of this domain. We would like to understand whether there is a difference uh, between these two items, or uh, is there somehow the same? I would like to ask you to rate yourself in the chat box if you can please reflect and answer this question. How much are you familiar with the concepts of learning analytics and educational data mining from one to seven? Please rate you, yourself. One to two, thank you for the for our um, uh, colleague, Dr. Azam, who sent the first message. Other participants, please. Thank you, Juan. Others, I will wait for three or four answers, and then I will continue. Many thanks, many thanks, three. Thank you, thank you for reflecting. Please just you know, search your uh, information, your knowledge, so that make it, maybe you can have some data about the differences between these two terms. So let's go on and continue our journey uh, with, you know, understanding the difference between these two concepts. 
when you talk about the data, about data mining, in you know, uh, I mean, uh, scientific text in this field, not the general ones, uh, for the let's say the experts of the field, when they talk about data mining, they uh, mean applying techniques for uncovering the patterns in the uh, big data that they are the hidden patterns. So when they talk about data mining, they mean techniques used. They are mostly statistical and mathematical and, you know, uh, techniques based on artificial intelligence that they are used for, uh, you know, conducting data mining. On the other hand, let's talk about learning analytics. When you talk about learning analytics, it is the matter of applying these patterns to optimize teaching learning process. So you can see, uh, in from the expert's viewpoint, data mining are, is the techniques that is used, the techniques that are used, and learning analytics, the, it is the application of those results. So data mining is more related to the experts that they work on, you know, data mining approaches, they know mathematics, they know statistics very well, but learning analytics is more practical for, for a community of, you know, university teachers or medical educationists. In this slide, you can see some more details about the difference between EDM, I mean educational data mining, and LA, that I mean learning analytics. You can see that according to the discovery, EDM focuses on automated discovery of the patterns. In contrast, in learning analytics, the judgment of the human is important. So you, you know, you pose a question and then you seek for answers and you use those hidden patterns discovered automatically in EDM to understand and interpret what is going on in learning system. In the next row, you can see that EDM is the matter of reducing and chunking the system to its components so that it can be understood. But for learning analytics, we aim at understanding the whole system and understanding the holistic patterns that can help us in decision making. When you talk about the origin, the origin of EDM is educational software and student modeling. So you look at what is recorded in the educational software or the modeling you know, patterns that are used in these techniques of data mining. In contrast to learning analytics, where you you know you uh, focus on semantic web outcome prediction and systemic interventions that are conducted. When it comes to adoption, in EDM sometimes it is automatically adopted, but in learning analytics today we are going to have more personalized learning environment by using those you know, hidden patterns. And when it comes to, uh, lastly to the techniques, uh, the techniques used are in EDM are some kind of classification, clustering, relationship minding, that some of them are so complicated. And for learning analytics, you, uh, you know, you are seeking for social network analysis, influence analysis, effectiveness analysis, and so on. So this slide is, uh, you know, uh, it gives you a big picture of the differences of these two domains. Actually, if you want to work in these two topics and you want to use these two terminology correctly, uh, there are more differences between two, these two terms. But, but for this presentation, as here is a society of, you know, medical, by medical teachers and medical educationists, uh, for sure, we should focus on the term learning analytics rather than data mining or educational data mining that is more technical and maybe it is not our job or our task or our expertise for most of us. So let's go to the 
learning analytics. Let me ask if there is any question here, you can uh, raise your hand or uh, write in the chat box and uh, my colleagues will help me if I miss some uh, collaboration in the chat box because I should, you know, make this box of chats short so that I can read my own slides. For learning analytics, uh, let's continue our journey. There are, as I just told you in the definition of learning analytics, you analyze your learning in three different categories. The first one is learning experience. What do we mean by learning experience? It is understanding more about our learning activities. What learners and what you, teachers are doing in the learning in the environment. And they are, you know, uh, we are seeking for identifying usage patterns for these activities. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't matter what the context is, it can be uh, e learning courses, social learning environments, applications, MOOCs platforms, or even face to face in person courses. So you seek for understanding learning experiences. I know that it is a bit vague. So let's have some sample questions for this category so that it can be well understood. In learning experience, you answer questions like this. How much is the activity being used? For example, uh, let's say quizzes, assignments, chats, discussion forums. How much is the activity being used? When is it being used? How long is it used by learners? What topics do learners search for? And how do learners navigate the learning experience? So the questions that we raise when it comes to learning experience, and we would like to answer by to analyzing the you know, data generated in our learning context are examples like this. Let's go to the second category. In the second category, it is the matter of understanding more about each individual learner or maybe the group of learners who are engaged in our teaching learning environments. And they want to learn. They are there to learn something. So we gather and analyze data from their perspective, not stakeholders or experience-based perspective. And the questions that may, we may answer in this category are like these that are written on the slide and I'm going to read them. Who is learning the most and the least? Who has completed the training? What are learners' skills and gaps? Who needs support? What are the topics of interest for the learners? So you can see that learner analytics in this category helps us to answer these kind of questions. And I'm sure that as a teacher, um, because maybe most of you in this room, you are, uh, you know, somehow university teachers, um, always we have some these kind of questions about our learners in our mind. Uh, who needs support, which, you know, um, among my learners, who is conducting the best and the least, who has, you know, which kind of gaps and so on. So learning analytics would be helpful in this regard. And finally, the last category is about learning program itself. So we want to understand a learning program performance and we focus on overall learner and learning experiences, you know, data analysis. And the questions that we are going to answer in this category are the ones like, do learners perform better after training? What is the impact of the program on expected performance? Is this teaching learning method cost effective? Which teaching strategy is more effective? So you can see that the answers to these kind of questions are categorized under three umbrellas of learning experiences, learners, and learning programs. And by looking at the sample questions, you may have a big picture of what 
the domain of learning analytics is all about. We are going to answer these kind of questions systematically, automatically, and accurately, so that we can say that we have conducted learning analytics. Some other examples that we can answer, some of them are the combination of two or three of those categories that we just reviewed. One of them is, for example, tracking the student's progress, progress helping the students self-evaluate their own performance, monitoring the students' activities, which is interesting to me, knowing the students before starting your course. This is really a fantastic, you know, uh, opportunity, understanding a student enrollment patterns, measuring the impact of a student engagement, and using a student performance data for redesigning curricula. You know, this is what we do not pay attention, even I have not found so many articles for the last bullet, last point, that uh, there are uh, instances that uh, data generated for, le for learning analytics for, could be used for reforming or changing, uh, you know, biomedical or higher education curricula. But it is a really fantastic application of uh, learning analytics. Now that we have become familiar with the concept and definition and domain of learning analytics, let's answer to the why WH question. Why is learning analytics used? In this table, this is this was a really good summarization of you know the benefits of learning analytics for different stakeholders that are governance institutions learning designers facilitators and learners and you can see that in each row uh, this table has categorized the benefits into three different domains of summative real time and predictive aspects. For example, for example, for governance, you can say that at the governmental level, learning analytics would help in applying cross-institutional or institutional comparisons. It increases productivity at the governmental level, national level, and also it can help us plan for change management in our educational systems. So these are three, the, the different, you know, benefits of learning analytics that are summarized in this slide, but because it is so long and it is so detailed, I have picked some of them that, uh, that uh, was more interesting maybe, or more applicable, let's say, and I will review these bullets in this slide among, uh, you know, the points mentioned in the previous table. One of the main benefits is implementing personalized learning, which we will discuss that it is somehow the future of learning analytics domain as well. We have the chance of tracking a student's performance. And let me add one point. When I read the you know, uh, literature in the learning analytics. I always think of teaching analytics too, because uh, I I suppose that, uh, you know, in addition to tracking, for example, a student's performance, they can track teacher's performance as well, you know? Uh, and so learning analytics is not a matter of focusing on, on students, However, in the literature, when you read the literature, the focus is more on the students. But I would like uh, to conduct some researchers that uh, focus on teachers' performance in uh, learning, teaching learning environments rather than students, because their performance, their you know, activities are recorded as well. Let's go to the third bullet, that is predicting a students at risk. You can, uh, you know, predict the students that need more help or they are quitting the course or have some problems. Uh, learning analytics helps you collect uh, real-time information from your educational, you know, context. It helps you provide instant feedback and act 
you know, and the relevant acts, needed acts to fulfill the gaps or deficiencies. It helps you discover a student's use of educational resources. Always we have a question that what uh, are the students' preferences with regard to educational methodologies, a type of educational, you know, contents and resources and so on. So learner analytics, would you help you answer such kind of questions? It enables teachers to improve their teaching. Here it comes uh, the teacher aspect of learning analyt uh, analytic usages, you know, and it is, uh, you can monitor your teachers and you can measure your students' motivation or engagement and many other benefits that learning analytics would bring to the domain of uh, education in all levels of, you know, elementary, secondary, and higher education. So, you know, although there are several benefits for these, uh, you know, types of learning analytics, um, it is worth mentioning to focus up on some of its challenges as well. Because if you don't consider the challenges and you just look at the benefits, you know, uh, it is somehow not realistic and uh, the concept is not rational. So the main challenges mentioned in the literature for learning analytics is privacy issues. I'm not talking about privacy issues so much. Uh, only I read a, a sentence that worked for me a lot, you know, I it was so interesting for me. And that is uh, this sentence that is written in the slide. One example of privacy issue and challenge is when you predict a student being a good or bad one, and then you label him or her to be so. And the psychological consequences of this labeling. This is the matter of privacy challenge of learning analytics. When you predict something, you may put labels on the you know, that individual learner or institution even, or teacher. So this is a privacy challenge. This challenge, you need to have, you know, clear policies about authentication and access issues. Uh, and if you don't do so, you will have difficulty for conducting and reporting learning analytics. These transparent policies would, uh, should include uh, you know, policies for collecting personal information, describing data usage for you, and describing your clear methodology for data collection and data security. And the last but not the least, please pay attention to the, this last point, determining the time period of keeping the data and deletion process. This is an interesting point, you know, it is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, rational, uh, you know, let's say, um, demand that uh, the data would be kept forever so that whenever we want, we can come back to them and conduct whatever type of learning analytics that we want. Uh, institutions, uh, especially the pioneer ones, have clear various policies that for how much time they would keep the data recorded and then what is the deletion process you know, requirements and uh, details. So the, this, this is the main aspect that should be transparent when it comes to working with big data of our uh, users of a learning system. The other challenge that is mentioned in the literature is security ones that uh, you, we should consider the CIA model that stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. And this security is, you know, is a common challenge in all, let's say, digital-based uh, interventions that the data should be kept secure. And then, please pay attention, it is said that nowadays, uh, we have challenges regarding the results of learning analytics and the data gathered, both of them, I mean, at the level of data gathering and also analyzing the data, they should be accurate. 
we should be able to guarantee that the data that is gathered and the analysis that was conducted is accurate enough to be used for decision making. And also, we have the challenge of some restrictions, for example, those copyright issues that may restrict us for using some kind of data or some data sets. There are some challenges that should be resolved. For some of this, the literature has no clear answer yet. For example, the last one, the ownership of the data. Learners and teachers are working in learning environments and their activities are recorded. Who is the owner of these gathered data, automated, automated gathered data? Uh, students, teachers, the, I mean the holders of those activities and those footprints or the institutions that they are delivering the course or the, that edu specific educational program. So please pay attention that these challenges are the ones that should be considered when you think of a question about learning analytics, or you would like to conduct some research or some, you know, uh, some techniques for doing so. Now, let's continue our journey and let's answer to who. Who benefits from, from learning analytics? Please reflect on this question for yourself. Who benefits the most? Who are the stakeholders of an educational system? Four categories of stakeholders benefit from learning analytics. Learners, instructors, instructional designers and researchers, and finally institutions. Let's say almost every group of stakeholders, they benefit from learning analytics reports. Why? Because they are provided by timely information. And in this way, they can, you know, uh, they can have better decision making, which leads to the improvement in the students' learning or educational system performance. So, these are all some all of these stakeholders are users of the reports of learning and you know and learning analytics at their own levels of access. Let's go through them one by one. Learners, learners when they have data about uh, analyzing the learning process, they can uh, self-evaluate themselves and enhance their performance. They can, you know, benefit from personalized learning environments that learning analytics helps them to build. And also there are some chances for them. For example, the system can recommend courses or activities to them according to their previous performance. And one example for this uh, group of stakeholders is when the students are informed about their learning process and compare their performance with their peers. So these progress bars, these uh, progress graphs, uh, you know, that are the visualization of learners' status compared to their peers or the timeline of the course. Sometimes we compare the progress of the student with their peers, sometimes we compare their progress with course outline. These are helpful, you know, uh, tools that, uh, you know, may help each individual learner to self-evaluate, uh, uh, you know, what she or he should plan for studying better. Let's go to the second group of uh, stakeholders who are instructors. Of course, they can enhance their teaching quality. For example, by having uh, the data generated from learning analytics, they may understand maybe in this specific subject that they teach, uh, for example, mini quizzes, micro quizzes works the best. Lecture is beneficial or not, effective or not. Which type of 
educational methodology would work the best. And this helps them improve their teaching quality. And of course, they have enough data to provide real-time feedback to their students. And for this paper uh, purpose, sometimes LMSs, they are equipped with tools that help teachers to monitor their students and have adequate data for providing feedback and analyzing their progress. And sometimes uh, there are some applications designed for these purposes, and there are some ads on that, uh, you know, teachers have, and they have data from different sources of students' activities, and they generate uh, analytical reports and demonstrate it to the instructors. The third category, instructional designers. And let me put researchers next to instructional designers as well. And it becomes instructional designers and researchers. The benefits for these stakeholders uh, are evaluating courses, improving courses, because they can conduct informed you know, instructional design based off, based on analytics, based on data that is, uh, you know, analyzed and reported. They can discover new methods of delivering educational information. And an example for this kind of learning analytics uh, stakeholder benefit is comparing learning analytics techniques to, so that they can recommend the best ones for a specific teaching learning context. And the last category of stakeholders, uh, they are institutions. Of course, evidence for uh, informed decision making is a fantastic privilege of learning analytics for higher education. And the example is by using these analytics, for example, the retention rate can be increased you know, by detecting the gaps, the deficiencies, and then conducting some actions, uh, they can prevent the uh, dropouts and increase their retention rates. Okay. Is there any question? Yes or no? You can write into chat box whether I can continue my presentation or not. One or two or three feedbacks, and then we will continue. Continue? Yes? So I will continue, and we will have your questions at the end of the presentation. The next question, please, thank you. Thank you very much for your feedback. The next question that you're going to answer is, when is learning analytics used? Please look at this for uh, this, let's say, multiple, multiple choice question. Learning analytic is used for blah, blah purposes, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. Please uh, choose your answer. More than one answer can be correct. You can say one, two, uh, one of them, or some of them, or all of them. And please, if you are convenient, you can, uh, you know, write in the chat box your answer. One, two, three, four, or all of them, or maybe some of them. What is your opinion? All four. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Other one, two, and three. Thank you. Any other idea? All, all. One and two, thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, all of them. Actually, the colleagues that have answered all of them, this is the correct answer. And to elaborate it more, please look at this diagram that is generated by Gartner Institute, that is one of the pioneer companies in the field of innovative uh, technologies including technologies in the field of education. You can see that these four levels are the levels of learning analytics. And when we go from descriptive analytics to diagnostic and then predictive and finally prescriptive 
techniques, the value and difficulty increase. So in descriptive analytics, the questions are all about what happened. So you have questions about what happened. Then it comes to diagnostic ones. The question is, why did it happen? In the next level, as the predictive analytics, the question is, what will happen? We are going to forecast something. And finally, the most complicated one is prescriptive analytics. The question is, how can we make it happen? It means that we recommend some actions so that by conducting those actions, we expect you know, a predicted outcome to be happened. So these levels of learning analytics shows that in every level of our you know, uh, educational system for different purposes, we can use learning analytics and we can answer our questions, of course, for the first levels, the techniques are more developed in the literature. The data can be you know, analyzed better and uh, can be interpreted better. But when it comes to the more difficult, the more difficult levels, sometimes we have difficulty in the literature and there are you know, unknown aspects uh, with regard to data mining techniques even. I mean that statistical and mathematical techniques or the matter of data being uh, suitable for usage that I am going to explain it more. And then the next question comes, how to analyze learning? at this slide, this is uh, the learning analytic life cycle. Of course, it is a simple, minimized uh, cycle because there are uh, hype cycles that are cycles that, are, that have more components, but this is good for this presentation because it is a, a minimal one, you know. It says that uh, learning analytics starts with learning environment where our users, including teachers and students, they conduct their activities, they interact, and they put their footprints as records of data, records of, for example, uh, number, number of conducted activities, time spent, attention, you know, sending emojis, likes, ratings, and so on. So in the learning environment, we have lots of activities and data log. These logs of data, when it comes huge and considering the other aspects of big data, they become big data, a big set of data, which is suitable for conducting analytics techniques on them. And then there are techniques that learning analytics are conducted and the reports are resulted to some actions to be conducted in the learning environment again. So this is the high cycle of learning analytics. Those three quadrants we have already talked. Uh, we have talked about learning environment that we gather data from, from three categories of, if you remember, learners, learning experiences, and learning programs. And then we talked about big data and its characteristics, and we reviewed some examples of actions that we can do with regard to learning analytics. For example, tracking the students, monitoring the students at risk, and so on. But till now in this presentation, we have said nothing about the methods of learning analytics. So this is how focuses on this quadrant. How do we analyze learning environment? There are two categories of this methodology, quantitative and qualitative ones. When it comes to quantitative, you can uh, you now read a wide range of quantitative methodologies in the literature. But three of the main category, categories are the ones that uh, you can read in this slide. 
The first one is a statistical analysis. Uh, in this type of quantitative uh, data analysis, as usual, we apply statistics and mathematical operations on data. For example, we consider number of visits, monthly, monthly time spent on each activity or task, and so on, or the number of emojis, kind of, or the, I don't know, ratings that learners, you know, do, and so on. There are the data that we perform a statistical analysis on them, and uh, we have some reports. The second category of these, the methodology of this quantitative learning analysis is visualizing these data. So we interpret this information into uh, charts, diagrams, mind mappings, concept maps, and so on. And uh, these uh, visualization are demonstrated sometimes in dashboards, dashboards that students, teachers, or administrators, they have access at their own level and they can see the graphics or, you know, um, uh, different visualized, uh, you know, uh, pictures, images, mind mappings, and so on, that uh, you can understand better what is uh, the comparison to the previous uh, one that is only the matter of numbers. And the third category is quantitative social network analysis. So you can see that when it comes to social learning and social networks, we can use data that are recorded over there so that you can understand the atmosphere of the class. And uh, you can even provide better learner support or redesign the course. So uh, the indicators like number of comments, time spent in the uh, um, social network, or number of likes, number of uh, every log data that is quantitative ones are the indicators that can be used in this uh, context. I would like to share you one of our own uh, experiences that the publication is published in a Q1 article, the first phase of our pro project. We uh, conducted a systematic review of literature and we um, extracted the indicators in learning management systems, LMSs, that are, uh, you know, used, can be used for predicting a student engagement in the course. So we searched the literature, we found out the indicators that when you count them and you conduct a statistical analysis on them, you can predict uh, the academic achievements of the, of the students of that specific context. The review of literature is already published in a Q1, you know, high prestige journal. But uh, following our work that we are submitting the next article, we have conducted these engagement indicators in the LMS, in our national LMS in Iran. And then we had conducted a statistical analysis to uh, predict whether this log data of a student engagement in the, uh, in the LMS is capable of predicting a student achievement, academic achievement or not. So this quantitative learning analytic method, and I suppose it will be, this uh, article will be published in a good journal too, because uh, it, uh, it has some messages for the literature. So you can see that for quantitative learning analysis, if you have a good log data, you can, uh, Determine your questions. For example, what our question was uh, LMS indicator, LMS, you know, uh, log indicators that can predict a student engagement in the course. So the focus of our research was on a student engagement. And uh, then we conducted a learning analytic protocol to answer our question. Let's move on and let's, uh, you know, go from quantitative approaches to qualitative ones that are more difficult to conduct. This qualitative, uh, again, I have mentioned two approaches here for this presentation. One of them is emotional intelligence. Uh, 
it uh, let's let me uh, share my you know emotion about this emotional intelligence with you it is a fantastic area of learning analytics and artificial intelligence applications in the education it is related to psychology and sociology you know domain of science domains of science and it helps you that you determine indicators to understand the emotional intelligence of the system or learners in a specific learning context and have some solutions to increase learners motivation learners increase uh, engagement and so on and the second approach is qualitative social network analysis. Just in the previous slide, I talked about quantitative social network analysis, but besides that, we have the qualitative approach to analyze a social network that is dedicated to a learning purpose. And in this way of uh, analysis, you use, uh, you know, techniques like uh, methodologies like observation, interviews, and surveys to understand what is going on in a social learning network. Now, I hope that you have not become bored and you are with me all. Uh, so let's look at this, how to analyze learning from another point of view, that is the levels of learning analytics. The first level is just measurement, okay? In this phase, you, only and simply gather the data without any statistical analysis. Maybe, maybe some of you would like to ask me, it is obvious and it is not so important. What is it, why it is mentioned as the first level of learning analytics? Because we suppose that the data is recorded automatically. This is not the case. When you look at the databases of uh, learning environments like LMSs or synchronous even uh, applications like Zoom or uh, e-portfolios, e-logbooks, and so on, you may understand that some records are not, some fields, some pieces of data are not recorded correctly. And you have missed data. Maybe you do not believe it, but this is the case. Or sometimes you are going to work on a data and you understand that something is missing. So at the measurement level, you should pay attention to your question of learning analytics and you define every individual piece of data that you need and you just you know, provide the facility or infrastructure for gathering them from different sources. So this is only data gathering, but complete, comprehensive, and accurate one. At the second level, when you gather data, it comes to evaluating the correctness of the data, whether the data is good or bad for your purpose. Again, Another example of our own experience that we have conducted several researchers in this field. In our national LMS, we have merged our national LMS with the student administrative systems of the universities, of all universities in the country. So that at the beginning of each semester, all courses with the instructors and the students are fetched from the student administrative system to the LMS. When we wanted to conduct learning analytics, we had a, you know, maybe you may call it um, a confusing or let's say ridiculous, let's say ridiculous problem. For a, a specific course in Iran, the codes, uh, identical codes in the the student administrative system, that software, are not identical throughout the country. What do I mean? I mean that, for example, for the course of clinical pathology, for example, you can see that in University A, 
It is labeled as code 10. In the second university, it is coded as 25. In the third university, it is coded as 125. So the software and analytics understand numbers, not text. And these codes are not unique nationwide. So if you have a question on the course of clinical pathology, for example, you want to understand um, how is the progress of a student's nation in the course of clinical pathology, you do, don't have unique ID in different systems. And the software and your analyzing system does not understand that these different codes are talking about one individual course. I hope that I'm clear. And when you come to this, the term that IT men use, they say that this is a dirty data. It is not a clean data, it is a dirty one. So it is hard to, uh, you know, interpret them and put them into analysis. And you should do a lot before starting your learning analysis to clean your data and make it good for further analysis. And because you are talking about big data, this evaluation and this cleaning is not a simple task. At the third level that you have a clean data, good data, you are capable of conducting advanced evaluation on data. These are most more complicated, complicated statistical techniques uh, such as uh, correlations and regression analysis and so on. And then you can predict or prescriptive your, uh, prescribe uh, your uh, analytics. For predictive analytics, the matter is based on what happens in the past, what is most likely to happen next. And when you talk about prescriptive analytics, it is based on what's most likely to happen next, what is the action we should take to optimize the outcome. And finally, at the last part of the presentation, let's answer the question where? Where will we stand in the future with regard to learning analytics? There are five categories that is the future of learning analytics. First, personalization of learning process. This personalization nowadays are instances of this experience, not uh, you know, so long. Uh, it will be a time that it is a routine practice in teaching learning process. In learning design, now you can have you have lots of published articles and evidences in the literature that they have said something about learning analytics and instances and applications, but they are not implemented in course and learning designs. This is going to be a routine in our practice as a teacher. The third category is learning experience design. We are going to provide better support and guidance to our students, and some of them will be automatically provided, and it, it will you know, depict a fantastic environment of learning for us students. And dashboard design, you will have intelligent dashboards that teachers, administrators, and the students can look at them and, uh, you know, um, can judge about the actions that they need to do. And finally, this is the matter of industry for applications. Applications like inter Internet of Educational Things will, come, will become a routine in educational context. So, in addition to the log data, for example, in the LMSs or educational environment, these educational Internet of Things applications would help us to gather data from sensors rather than recorded activities. And both of them together will help us in conducting good learning, teaching learning process. And finally, as a conclusion, whatever I just told you is summarized in this uh, framework that uh, says that learning analytics is about uh, data environment and context, what is going on in these environments. 
and the questions and why we are doing so and who benefits from it that are different types of stakeholders and finally how we conduct learning analytics that, that we talked about some of its methods. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope, let me go to the last slide and uh, this flower is dedicated to you all. Thank you for your uh, attention and I hope uh, this is beneficial for you. Uh, I'm ready for any questions or Thank ask. You so much. You know that uh, learning analytics is an emerging trend. Mm -hmm. And like any other uh, emerging uh, trend, especially in the field of digital applications or, you know, uh, technologies, it takes time. Pioneer universities, they are working on clarifying uh, you know, policies, rules, and regulations for copyright issues, ownership issues, and so on. And I hope that it only takes time. But it is worth mentioning that when we work in, a, in our own environment, uh, in our own university, when it comes to data, it is good to have a policy for it, you know? So the minimum level is available. When you look at the university, the pioneer university websites and literature, you can have a picture, for example, for your ethical concerns, for your, uh, you know, privacy concern, ownership, you can define a policy. And it is important to pay attention to these uh, policies. Uh, this is the case. And about your question, you know, when it comes to uh, technology enhanced applications, whatever it is, the digital ones, we forget that in the tra traditional methods we have risks too. I remember that when I was a medical student at Tehran University and I was passing my internship uh, in one of our educational hospitals, the archives of uh, patients, you know, and it caught a fire because everything no. was on paper and mm. so many records were lost yes. because of fire yes you know so for comparing technology-based methods with traditional methods we should be fair that even in traditional methods we have some kind of risk yes in you know, and at those times, we have lots of instances that we have read that, for example, in a paper-based archive, you can see that some attacks are conducted and some, you know, misusages are conducted from those papers, yes. of course, in every field, in banks, in, uh, in hospitals, in education, for grades of students everywhere. In my opinion, I have not read, uh, uh, read any evidences about this. This is not my field of expertise, but I suppose that maybe, maybe, if you look at the literature, you understand that the risks are less in digital era because you have the chance of backups, you have the chance mm -hmm. of mirroring the data and databases and so on. But when it comes to paper-based systems for big data, it is just one you know, one record of data. It is not possible to make it multiple and copy them and put physical spaces to record them. So mm -hmm. to be honest, I do not believe that these risks are not uh, in some other instances applied for traditional methods. We have risks. No, you know, I, if I, I have a task, I, yeah. I, ha I have the risk of getting out of electricity. This is equal now, to getting out of internet for yes. Now, now the other it's... question, the other question which is relevant and not quite relevant, but I think this is a burning issue, is the use of AI in AI. medical education. It has become integral. I mean, yes. like in the UK, for example, diagnostics are AI, therapeutics are AI, education is AI. We have a center, not far from where I live in London, where they started the entire thing, the deep mind, you know, the, the planning of the AI, etc. And I visit them sometimes, and I go to other colleges to, to learn uh, the new things. 
AI, particularly the new things like Chat GPT and Chat GPT four and five, what are your opinions in terms of medical education for gathering the data, writing essays, using them ethically? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Uh, this is not my opinion. Let's uh, let me answer your question considering the literature, not my own uh, opinion about this. I, uh, because of the limitation of time, I didn't put the hype cycle of learning analytics and AI uh, as an emerging trend in uh, education and higher education or clinical practice. You know that when a, a trend emerges, a technology emerges in the world. At first, it is going to go like this for peak yes. of expectation and lots of illusions about it. And when it comes to the peak of expectations, the evidences, works, I don't know, experiences of experts and users, this is this illusionized, you know, and everything, this is not as fantastic as we thought. And then it is going to go down, dramatically down. I mean, that if you look at my finger, it is goes like this to the peak, mm -hmm. and then it comes dramatically okay. down, and then it happens in a light slope to our mm -hmm. plateau. When you look, at, you look at the hype cycle, Gartner hype cycle of uh, AI, application of AI as a new trend at 2019, it is on its way toward peak of expectation. Yeah. Yeah. So you can understand that when it comes to domains of education, because it was in the technology expert, yeah, I mean, the technical experts. But for us as users, for clinicians and education is both, we are now in the in the our way of peak of expectation and disillusion of disillusionation of the process. I mean that nowadays everybody talks about AI in clinical practice, AI in yes. medical education, and high expectation. It will substitute doctors. It will substitute medical teachers. Yes. It will substitute yes. researchers. As I know from the literature, we are on the top of peak of expectations. And very soon, because it is a hot topic, and now you can see the footprints of literature about the negative aspects, or let's say limitations of these applications, we are going to, it is going to be more reasonable very soon. Mm -hmm. It is fantastic. It will revolutionize everything, clinics, education. But it is not uh, such a thing that it will substitute everything. It will go to a plateau place and our career will change. The same that has happened, for example, for the synchronous e-learning platforms. Our rules mm -hmm. have changed. But still, we are here, but not in a face-to-face -face and uh, we should learn something else in order to be capable to use this application. So in AI, uh, about three years ago, because you know that Gartner hype cycles have copyrights and I have not access to the latest ones. I should, uh, we should wait so that they are published in an article. And mm -hmm. the last one in the field of uh, uh, education, that AI was mentioned, and I have the file is on 2019, about three years ago. So, and you see that it is on its way to our peak of expectation. Yeah, I, I think that there is still some time before it reaches the peak, because uh, still continuing to rise. I mean, AI, I was talking to a radiologist in America at the top university. They're using um, radiology in I mean, beyond, AI has become almost inseparable too. And they are diagnostic, the uh, sort of proficiency, efficiency, and the quality is improved. And they find that yeah. early carcinoma, the, the AI picks up much faster than they would do clinically. It saves time, it saves energy, and it also saves a lot of effort 
plus yeah. the diagnostic yeah. errors that go with it. Yeah. So there is still scope for further improvement. The same is this uh, in the use in the pathology, uh, diagnostic pathology. They're taking yeah. the carcinoma. Uh, the, uh, I was in a conference in Malaysia. There is a use of you know, the machine learning is there. Are, sir, they have invented microscopes who can easily pick uh, the level of, uh, I think, in the future. But I think my suggestion is that if we, we will not use our intelligence, we will lose the intelligence. So mm -hmm. artificial intelligence does not mean that we all rely on the artificial intelligence who can take the help. We should mm -hmm. use our intelligence. We can take the help of uh, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and learning and deep learning. Yeah. And, uh, I and have an opinion, sir. Mubashir okay. here. So uh, basic, okay. yes, sir. Okay. Basically, we are at an inflection point. Yes, yes. So sir. we are not understanding when we were using papyrus in Egypt. And then it was replaced with the paper. We realized that now the paper is more intelligent. Now paper is being replaced by the digital era. We did not realize that it is more important to use digital medium. But you will see like Link, uh, two weeks ago in US, the Tesla-based Link, which is a brain uh, yeah. implanted chip, is approved for helping paralysis patients. So what do you think? It will able to help people see, hear and record, see and record and recall that memory in real time to visualize some of that what you have watched. So we are at an infection probably by 2040, 2045, humans will be basically governed by machines. Yes. So we are just a sitting duck and we should not stop this. We should be, be basically be part of it to help improve learning and education okay. thank you sir. Dr. Badr Mustafa from Saudi Arabia very long time you are in our webinar Dr. Badr and Mustafa Dr. Badr and Mustafa uh, senior teachers uh, very thanks a lot Dr. Badr appreciate, appreciated Professor Bukhari I do just agree with the last uh, sentences that we are moving from our recall then we are putting things in written and digitalizing the things and overhead we are now uh, going to the era of artificial intelligence still that there is a place for our intelligence to make use of that artificial intelligence as a tool uh, for our deep and widened understanding and as well production. Uh, whether it is in the teaching or even in our uh, life uh, time. Uh, over to you, Professor uh, Shabizadi, to conclude today's session. Well, thank you so much. It has been a marvelous, marvelous, as expected of Rita. Rita always comes up with the brightest possible, and so does her partner and husband and dear friend, uh, Ayn Muhammadi. Rita, please. Professor Zaidi, thank you, Professor Bukhari and uh, Dr. Iftahar, for your nice, uh, you know, support and your nice words uh, to me. I do appreciate your efforts. I follow each individual activity of you for building and maintaining, let's say, because building is easy. Building a yeah. network is easy, but maintaining is, uh, it is another thing, and it is uh, an arduous task, I do believe. So I appreciate your efforts and uh, hope the best for you all. And I would thank, thank you. all of the participants again for putting their precious time for this webinar. Many times, and I'm at your service as usual, whatever I can, I can be a member of Most the great. society. It's an honor. Thank you. Most Thank great. you, madam. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.